So, um, hello everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk about Rust, which is a programming language, and also about getting, well, getting Rust into OpenSUSE and the current state of where we are. Uh, so yeah, so I'm Christopher Grenland. I am the uh, architect for HA at SUSE. Um, so it has nothing to do with Rust, but I'm, but I'm interested in the language. So this is this is kind of my hobby. Uh, if you want to get the slides, you can get them from this URL. Uh, they will also be linked from the uh, Open SUSE events page. Um, and I'll provide a PDF later. So, uh, Rust is a programming language developed by Mozilla primarily as intended as a replacement for C and C++, really. Uh, the, the idea that they had was that they needed a new language or they wanted to develop a better browser um, that wasn't susceptible to security holes in the same extent that the current Firefox one is. They, they have a big issue with uh, buffer underflows and buffer overflows and uh, memory leaks and other problems like this, and they were trying to figure out a way to solve that. And so one way would be to switch to um, a managed language like Java or C Sharp or something like this, which runs in a VM, but that comes with additional problems. So if you, if you run in a VM and you have garbage collection, you have a runtime, um, you have unpredictable memory usage, memory uh, um, implications. Um, so basically, a modern browser is like a VM itself. Uh, it's, it's hosting a bunch of processes, one for each tab or window, uh, and it's hosting additional VMs inside to run JavaScript and so on. So running all that inside a VM again would be, okay, so we're starting to get too many virtual machines on top of virtual machines to have a viable solution. So what they wanted to do was be able to have a language that operates on the same level as C and C++, avoids the problems that C and C++ have in exposing too much of the machinery uh, of the system uh, and letting you destroy yourself uh, needlessly. So the idea with Rust is that it's a language which makes it more difficult to do things wrong. That's, that's the basic idea. Um, so today you can get the Rust compiler on... on uh, OpenSUSE by installing from the Devil Languages Rust project. Um, so the, basically, the Rust compiler that we have now is um, a pre-built binary package. So it's not yet ready to be included in uh, Tumbleweed because it's not building from source entirely. So to build Rust, you need Rust. Um, so I'm going to get into more what that means, but currently you need a specific version of Rust to build any version of Rust. And that version is not necessarily the version that we already have in OpenSUSE. So yeah, it's, it's a tricky problem. We haven't figured out how to solve it. I'm going to go into more of that. But first, I'm going to talk a little bit about the language. Uh, well, I, I think I've gone into why you want it. But um, so yeah, zero overhead as in no uh, runtime or VM or garbage collection. Uh, Memory safety, so a language which tries to prevent buffer overflows or uh, pointer arithmetic, so you can't just point into random memory and cause problems. You can still cause all the problems that you can cause in C in Rust. All Rust does is make it easier to do things right in the default case and more difficult to do things wrong. Whereas C, for example, makes it exceedingly easy to do things wrong uh, and not even know it, and very, very difficult to do things right. So that's kind of the, the difference in approach. Uh, a side benefit of, of the way they chose to handle memory was that they also introduced thread safety as a, as a bonus. And I'm going to go into a little bit about how that works, but basically 
the way that Rust handles memory has implications for threads, that means that it's impossible to create a deadlock because you, you just can't write the code that would cause a deadlock unless you actually have unsafe uh, blocks in there. So, yeah. Uh, and yeah, the other thing is you want C-level performance. Uh, so if, if these, and easy interoperability with C. So if these are things that are interesting to you, then Rust might be interesting as a language. Um, I, I know that there is maybe a, a little bit of a trepidation or of fear because um, Rust can be very hostile because it doesn't let you do things wrong. Uh, so it's just gonna, in the beginning, no matter what you do, you're gonna get a lot of error messages um, <laughs> when trying to compile. But uh, I'll, I'll get into that too uh, in more detail. So here is a very simple Rust program. Um, it looks uh, similar to C. Uh, if you look at it uh, just like this, uh, already in this, uh, there are a lot of things that are unique to Rust. Uh, for example, the uh, exclamation mark after print ln uh, means that this is a macro. And macros in Rust are, well, I think they are most similar to macros in templated Haskell or Scheme, if you've seen those languages, and not at all like macros in C or C++ or and also not especially like macros in Lisp or uh, something like this. So um, it's, uh, it's not as free form as the macros in other languages where you can just do anything in a macro, including like concatenating strings into new function calls, but it is quite uh, good at doing uh, some of the things you know, in a safe way. So for example, the print ln macro just adds a new line to the end of the string and then passes it to print. Um, uh, and that, the, that kind of thing is quite simple to do with this macro system. Uh, to compile and run this, you use the Rust compiler, or you can use the Rust compiler just like you would use uh, GCC. So you put, put this in a file, uh, call it hello.rs, um, you, you run Rust C, passing it hello.rs, and you get an executable just like you would get from uh, a GCC. It does, there's no runtime, so it doesn't link to any big uh, library or anything like that, but it is statically linked to uh, the standard library that it has. So the binary will become a, a fat binary. Currently, there is no dynamic linking. There is some support for dynamic linking, and they're working on making it better, but uh, yeah, th that's uh, w another one of the issues that we are looking at for packaging for OpenSUSE. We would like to be able to dynamically link to OpenSSL, for example, and currently it's not that easy. Um, so to scare you a little bit, here's a bigger example. <laughs> so this is um, a Rust program which creates a second thread and uses channels to communicate between the threads um, and has a shared hash map uh, where it, both threads try to insert into the hash map at, at the same time and then the main thread tries to read from the hash map. Um, and <clears throat> this is the kind of thing that in C or C++ is quite difficult to do in a thread safe way. Uh, and in Rust, you can't write this code in a way that would, would not be thread safe. Because uh, the compiler is aware, for example, that the hash map is not thread aware. So it, it won't even compile code that involves multiple threads using a hash map directly. So what you need to do is you need to wrap the hash map in a mutex, you need to lock in each thread. And uh, if you do the locking incorrectly, the compiler won't even compile the code. So, uh, and you can also see a, a few other features of Rust here. So um, you can uh, use modules. So it has like a full module system like other more modern languages uh, to include um, code from other modules. Uh, you can also, so if, uh, here for example, I'm calling std colon thread colon spawn without 
using use std thread first. Uh, so you can just fully qualify uh, module names and access things that way. Um, so it has some nice features like destructuring, so you can declare, uh, so the channel function returns uh, both the sending and receiving end of the communication channel for threads, uh, and return disease as two, a, a tuple of two separate things, and you can assign each to a name in one construction. Um, the colon colon new is, is a convention for memory ha handling. Uh, so this is simply putting uh, this memory on the heap. So uh, similar to new in C++ or Java. Uh, but the memory is actually managed uh, at compile time. So Rust will ensure that you have the correct number of allocations and everything is is uh, every reference is scoped, so this memory is freed when both threads go out of scope, uh, so to speak. Uh, there's a few other niceties like um, pattern matching that I will go into a little bit more. Uh, something you will see a lot when you start looking at examples of Rust is this uh, unwrap uh, thing. So. Rust doesn't have exceptions, uh, unlike Java or, or even C++. Instead, functions usually return what is called a uh, result type, which is uh, an enum of either OK with the value that you were after, or an error. And it actually checks at compile time that you've handled all of the cases. So it, it forces you to check, oh, is it okay? Then I do this. If it's not okay, then I do this other thing. So, so here, for example, it's saying, okay, if locking succeeds, uh, assign the res result to this um, M variable, and then let me access it within the scope of if. And then you can do, then put an else and handle the uh, failure, but in this case, it's just ignoring the error. And what unwrap does is, uh, let you continue if it, everything was okay, and panic, as in end the whole process if there's a failure at this point. So you see this a lot in example code, because in example code you don't want to clutter it with uh, error handling, uh, but of course in a real program you do want to handle your errors, and uh, the nice thing with having the unwrap thing is that you, do, you have a, an explicit point in the code that says, okay, this is where it's going to crash if there's a failure. Uh, so the, the thing that Rust does is make it very explicit where your, your failure points are. Uh, so this makes it easy to uh, find the source of the problem. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to go into much more about this example right now because uh, uh, it's, it's a little bit too much, but it's just showing an example of a little bit more realistic code than just the normal example code that you get for uh, things like this. So, <clears throat> this is a little bit about how allocation is handled in Rust. So, in this example, we have the main function, which uh, where we allocate. So, this is uh, simply a five, uh, like an integer, and it's uh, put in the box, which means that it's heap allocated, uh, but it it's Life st uh, lifespan is scoped by the block in which it's defined. Uh, so box two here, for example, uh, exists until the end of the main function. Um, you can create like a little scope like this to limit uh, the lifetime of variables. So box three here is just going to get created and then immediately destroyed. Uh, and then in this function, the box one, this uh, value is limited to the scope of that function. So, for example, Rust wouldn't let you create a box like this and then uh, pass it out uh, without uh, handling that correctly. So, um, so in this example, we're... Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> so the w there's a concept of ownership and moving ownership around in Rust. So that's how it's keeping track of memory. 
is that the compiler keeps track of who owns a piece of memory at every state of the program. So in this case, um, we start the program and we create two regular variables, and these are limited to this scope. So the owner is the main function in this case. Um, we then create this five and assign uh, the variable a to it. So in, at this point, main owns a. So we can actually read from it and print it at this point. Um, if we then create a second variable called b and assign to a, if we then try to here access a at this point, it doesn't let us because the, uh, the boxed memory that we assign to A has now been, the ownership has been transferred to B in this case. So Rust will no longer let us access A because A no longer owns that memory. That memory has moved on. Uh, so if you uncomment this line and try to run this program, the compiler will say, no, A is now, doesn't own this memory. You can't access A anymore. Uh, and then in the same way, if you pass, if you create a variable b, and then you pass that to a function like this, uh, that takes a box, um, the ownership is transferred to that function. So if you try to use b after this point, the compiler will no longer let you. It will say, no, uh, destroy box owned that memory, and at the end of its scope, the memory was freed because the owner of that memory went out of scope, and so it's no longer available. I freed it. And at this point, you would probably say, wow, this is completely unusable. How can I, if I can only use a variable once, uh, what, how can I do anything? If I, if I put destroy box in a loop here, it won't compile because only the first iteration of the loop, uh, the, it will pass the ownership in that iteration to the function and then free the memory. And the compiler will say, well, I mean, second iteration, there's no memory anymore. You can't do this. So, the way we get around this in Rust is with something called borrowing, which is where you can say, I'm still the owner of this memory. I want to call this function and pass it this memory, and then I let it borrow the memory for a while, and then when the function completes, I'm still the owner, the memory is still mine. Um, so the way you do this is with the, uh, uh, let's see, the at here, where, <clears throat> We're saying that in this sco scope, uh, well, with the at here as well. So in this scope, we're borrowing uh, the memory of this point, which is a struct, just like in C, has three members. Um, so point is the variable, and main is the scope, which owns this memory, owns this variable. We create a, a second scope in here, and we borrow it using the at uh, here. And we can use it uh, to look at it, but it's actually, by default, the borrows are immutable or const, uh, you would say. So it can look at the values. Um, at the end of the scope, the main scope still has ownership, um, but we can't assign to it. So <clears throat> to get a mutable borrow, we, we have to use the at mut, uh, or mut, I don't know how to pronounce that. Um, uh, operator, and, it di and here we can actually, so the ownership is still maintained by main, but the right rights, so to speak, the right to modify the variable is temporarily transferred to this other scope, this other variable. We can assign to the structure in, in here, and then at the end of scope, those rights are transferred back, so at this point, the main point variable now has the rights again. And, they, and those rights are actually uh, transferred when it comes to writing. So there can only ever be one writer to a piece of memory. Um, so the compiler will actually make sure that there's only one piece of code at any time which has the right to modify memory. And that is the reason why all Rust code is actually thread safe as well. Uh, because this means that no matter how many threads you have, only one of them is at any point allowed to modify the memory. And the, at compile time, it will actually verify that this is true. Uh, so that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, but it's also uh, pretty tricky to write code in Rust <laughs> because of this. Uh, 
Another aspect of Rust, which is a little bit different from other languages, is uh, what's called traits. Uh, so the language which I think uh, this is most similar to is uh, Haskell, but it's also a little bit similar to the interfaces that you have in Go. So in, in Rust, you don't have classes like in uh, C++ or Java. Uh, what you have is you have structs, just like in C, and then you have traits which describe collections of functions that operate on a particular structure. Um, so in this case, we're defining a trait animal, and we're defining a set of methods which can be applied to an animal. But we're not actually defining any kind of structure that implements this trait at this point. So there's no base class or there's no uh, like root object that's like the default implementation. What we're saying is that there is such a thing as an animal. We haven't actually described any yet, and these are not actual functions that you can call at this point. Uh, so you need you need something that implements this trait. And the way this is done is you define a structure. And separately from defining the structure, you define an implementation of... So, okay, so this is just implementing some functions for the structure. So it's saying that, okay, so we have a structured sheep, and separate from the structure definition, we define some methods for sheep. Um, and this can be done multiple times. So you can have multiple blocks like this where you're defining methods that apply to sheep. Um, so it's not like a class in that sense that the, it couples the data of the structure with the methods that can be applied to the structure, you can actually separate those. So you can have a library that provides methods for a structure that is defined elsewhere. Um, and then we can implement the animal trait for sheep um, and implement these functions for the sheep type in particular, uh, which then lets us use uh, these methods on sheep structures or other structures that also implement the animal trait. And we can have a function that takes an animal as parameter, uses the methods of animal on it, and uh, we, can call, we can pass in the sheep to that method and it's just going to work. Um, and this is all uh, more similar to C++ templates than C++ classes in the sense that this is all uh, derived at compile time as well. So at compile time, it's figuring out which method to actually call for, for the animal in question. Um, so the way would you, you would use this is that you would create a variable uh, like this. And here you can see a little bit of the, um, the type inference in Rust, where it's figuring out that it needs to actually call the, the function that creates a sheep because the variable that we're assigning it to has to type sheep. Um, so that's a little bit, little bit tricky, but so it actually goes the other way. <laughs> so in previous examples, um, like here, for example, we have, we have a defined type of an object. So we have some memory of a certain type, and then we just say, okay, let the variable point be that type. And then the compiler figures out, okay, so this is type point, then this also has to have that type. But in this case, it's actually going in the other direction. So it's saying, okay, we, we have a generic function here that creates animals, and we're assigning it to a variable of a specific type. Then that generic function must actually be the cheap constructor. And so it can go in that direction as well. Uh, all right, so I also put up, so this is the definition of uh, println macro. Um, so the macros are basically compiler plugins. So what this does is says when it sees the println macro, it passes the expression that that macro was passed to this code, which is then at compile time replaced. So, and the difference, w between this and uh, just having a function is that this this is all done uh, at compile time, so you can do, so here it's actually calling print and concat in, when compiling. So at runtime, the result is just a string constant. Um, if, if you're used to using something like Ruby or Python or another language like this, 
that's just total nonsense <laughs> because uh, there is no compile or runtime uh, in the same sense. But if you're coming from C or C++, then there is an actual difference. Uh, the, the code execution in these macros happen when compiling the code, not when actually running the program. Um, yeah. So uh, I think uh, for learning Rust in the beginning, you don't really have to use macros uh, at all. It's more uh, a neat feature later on, I would guess. So uh, some of my <coughs> favorite things about Rust so far is um, the uh, match and if let, which is uh, pattern matching. Uh, so, this is something from uh, Prolog and also Erlang, I think, has a, has a lot of this, but uh, it's also coming into other languages where um, you, at compile time, uh, say, okay, I'm returning either this or that from this function, and the compiler can check that I'm actually handling all the cases. So. In Rust, there is no null um, at all. So in, instead, functions can return optional values. So you would return, oh, it's either um, this object or it's nothing. And at compile time, it will check that you actually made sure that you got what you expected. Um, so there's, there's no way to write code that is uh, null, unsafe in that sense. Um, yeah, traits I talked about, and then the next thing is uh, Cargo, which is the uh, the package manager for for Rust. And uh, I know Lars is now looking at me like I'm crazy because we already discussed the pains of uh, package managers in languages. But uh, Cargo is quite nice, and uh, yeah, I'll get into the problems of it uh, for us as open source people later. Um, so Cargo is a tool that helps helps with using libraries and setting up projects. Um, so instead of using the Rust compiler directly, you, you can use Cargo to manage your project. Uh, so the way you would create a new project for our little hello pro code that I showed in the beginning is that you would call Cargo new hello and it will create uh, a, a Git repository for, for your project and uh, create a little main uh, function for it and everything, and set everything up so you can compile a binary from that. Um, and the main definition of a cargo project is the uh, cargo.toml file. Uh, Toml is a like any file, a similar uh, format, um, where you would define the, the name of your project, uh, the author name, uh, the version of this project, and then all the dependencies of this project. Uh, and also, if it produces a library, you would define that here as well, uh, instead of a binary. Um, and then to compile, you just run cargo build, and it, it takes care of uh, compiling if it's necessary, uh, and so on. So that's, that's quite nice. In Together with cargo, uh, there is something called crates, which is the... Uh, the packages for Rust. So there's crates.io, which is uh, like a package hub, just like for other languages. And uh, the way you would use it is in your cargo.toml, you define dependencies. So let's say we use the uh, rand module for random number generation. Uh, we would define the version we need and the dependency. And then we just call cargo build, and it's magically incredibly, just goes out on the internet, finds RAND and all the dependencies for it, downloads, compiles, great. Um, so, yeah, okay, so now I'm getting into the problems with this and uh, where, where we're at just right now. So, currently the people contributing to the Rust uh, packaging on OpenSUSE are, is this list. Uh, I think actually there are some more people who've gotten involved since I wrote this, but uh, the, main, the main guy is, uh, is uh, Mikal. I don't know if you're here. Uh, oh, great. All right, I'll talk to you later. <laughs> so he's done most of the work in getting the co compiler uh, up to date and uh, getting cargo in there and so on. Uh, but um, there is still a lot of work uh, remaining. So currently we have two main projects uh, under Devil Languages Rust. There is the uh, Rust compiler. Um, and there's uh, 
cargo bootstrap, uh, which is the cargo compiler thing. And the reason it's called cargo bootstrap is because it's not quite building itself in the right way yet. Um, we're using a Python project created by some Debian guys to build uh, cargo without cargo. Because the problem is that the Rust compiler is written in Rust. So to compile the Rust compiler, you need the Rust compiler. And cargo uses cargo to build itself. So to build cargo, you need cargo. Uh, and figuring this out is, is not that easy. Right now, my goal is to get the Rust compiler at least into Tumbleweed by Rust version 1.10, because they made a big important change in their policies as of Rust 1.9, which is that they promised that Rust 1.10 will be able to build itself using Rust 1.9, and so on. So if we, have, if we manage to package Rust 1.9, we can then use our packaged Rust version to build Rust 1.10. And by that point, we're bootstrapped and up and go going, so we can push it into Tumbleweed and, this, and remove the binary package for Rust 1.9. And when Rust 1.11 is released, we can rebuild it with our 1.10 package. So this is, this is very similar to the way you would have to package GCC from the beginning. So it's kind of a GCC is written in C, so you need a C compiler to compile GCC. Um, so you have the same problem there. It's just... Uh, <laughs> it's a little bit trickier than it might seem to actually figure out how to do this correctly. Um, yeah, so that's that. Uh, cargo is even worse because um, Cargo is a cargo project with a long list of dependencies. So to build the initial version of Cargo, we need to have like a fake Cargo which, or a binary package of Cargo which we can use to build that version of Cargo. Uh, and we need to get like the package management up and running to get this working. So this is the, kind of the point where we are at now, and this is the point after that where we haven't even gotten to. Um, so my idea for the future is that we will combine kind of the approaches of the Golang packaging stuff that uh, the, Go, the people... Um, I think it's Marguerite Su uh, at, of the project that has done most of that work for Golang uh, to package Go modules as RPMs and combine that with a little bit of how the Ruby stuff is managed using um, gem to rpm which is quite nice. And I've started working on that. Uh, there's, in my home project, there's something called cargo packaging, which uh, doesn't work at all right now, uh, but that's kind of point of where I'm at right now at looking at packaging Rust and getting into OpenSUSE. So that's, uh, yeah. Then beyond this, there are a lot of unsolved issues with actually using Rust and getting it into uh, SLE, for example. So there is no stable ABI for Rust itself, for example, uh, which means that if you compile your Rust program with a certain version of the Rust compiler, that comes with a certain standard library. And if you update your Rust compiler, you have to recompile your program. Uh, otherwise, it won't link correctly uh, if you use dynamic linking. So right now, we're limited to static linking, like building everything into one binary, um, which is yeah not great for uh, security updates and so on. The other problem is that the compilation of Rust itself and Rust programs is extremely slow and memory intense. So to compile the Rust compiler, we need uh, at least uh, eight gigabytes of RAM. And right now, I think the VM is defined to have 50 gigabytes of disk, and that's actually failing sometimes because it runs out of disk anyway. And I, I don't even understand why, how it can possibly use 50 gigabytes of temporary memory while building the compiler, but yeah, there we are. And um, it also, right now, it needs its own custom version of LLVM to build a Rust, because Rust is based on LLVM, and they have some patches to LLVM. Uh, so um, that's, that's another issue. We can't just use the LLVM, which is already packaged for OpenSUSE. We actually have to build LLVM again, just for Rust. Uh, so 
those are issues that are remaining to be solved. Like the ABI problem is something that we can't solve. We have to wait for the Rust community or, or do it there. Um, but uh, it's also one of the problems that I think is really difficult to solve. And the problem is that it's really only a problem for us as, as di distributions. So it's only a problem for uh, Red Hat and SUSE and a few other people. For Mozilla, for example, they don't care about static linking. They'll just, they use static link and uh, it works for them. Uh, so uh, that's, that's one of the issues we have. Yeah, so my main point is uh, please help in the packaging Rust. Uh, if any of the people who were involved in packaging Go packages, for example, or, or Ruby for OpenSUSE want to get involved in, in helping out with Rust, that would be great because I think, as far as I know, both me and uh, Michal uh, don't really know that much about it, about RPM macros, and this is all magic to us. We just want to get the compiler working. So, yeah, any help you can give us, that would be fantastic. Uh, any questions? Yes, they have a microphone. When do you expect to be able to do the bootstrap of Rust then so that you can do the continuous updates, etc.? So 1.9 has been released now like a few weeks ago and they're on a six week release schedule. So the next version of Rust will be 1.10, which will be released sometime in July, I think. Um, I'm hoping to have at least the Rust compiler uh, ready to submit or hopefully accepted into Tumbleweed by that time. That's, that's my, uh, my hope. All right, thank you. Oh, another question. Are there already some bigger software uh, in, written in Rust? Uh, yes, so there is... Um, so the, the biggest project right now is the Servo browser, which is being built by Mozilla. So this is the next version of Firefox, where next means not the next version, but sometime far, far in the future. Uh, so it's a whole new browser. Uh, I think they've gotten pretty far in like standards compliance and so on, but when it comes to like actual browser features, it's, they, they still have a long way to go. Um, there is also, I know there is something called Habitat, I think, which is developed by the Chef uh, people, so the people who make Chef, which is a part of Chef somehow, which is written in Rust. I don't know exactly, I don't know anything about it, and I might, may have gotten the actual <laughs> projects and details wrong. Um, as I think there are a few other like big projects, but not anything very open. Like There are big companies using it, but they haven't released anything publicly. Uh, but there is a lot of interest in Rust. I mean, it's, it's still a very new language. It's still being devel heavily developed. Um, so, I mean, if, if I were going to develop something for production today, I probably wouldn't use Rust right now. But uh, soon, I think it would be usable. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you.